You are watching DHTV from California State University, Dominguez Hills. Now we are in part four of the Gilded Age. And let's understand <clears throat> the Knights of Labor again. The Knights of Labor <clears throat> had a mixed history of inclusiveness and exclusiveness, accepting women and blacks after 1878 and their employers as members and advocating the admission of blacks into local assemblies. Well, what they did was they tolerated the segregation of assemblies in the South. Now, bankers, doctors, lawyers, stockholders, and liquor manufacturers are going to be excluded from the Knights of Labor because they were considered unproductive members of society. But they also excluded Asians. And in November 1885, a branch of the Knights in Tacoma, Washington, worked to expel the city's Chinese, who amounted to nearly a tenth of the overall city population at the time. The Knights are also going to be responsible for race riots that resulted in the deaths of Chinese Americans in the Rock Springs, what was known, uh, be known as the Rock Springs Massacre in Wyoming. Now, the Knights strongly supported the Chinese Exclusion Act of 1882 and the Contract Labor Law of 1885, as did many other labor groups, although the group did accept most others, including skilled and unskilled women of any profession. Now, ultimately, their motto would incorporate anyone who toiled except for Asians. Now, let's get to understand something with regards to the Asian dimension in this class. <clears throat> Chinese labor was used, especially after the Civil War, for connecting the railroads to California, to the Pacific Coast. Why were the Chinese so important? Because the Chinese were needed as labor forces to work in high elevations and because they had knowledge of explosives. So the railroad corporations took, that, took advantage of Chinese labor. But what happened once the railroads finished uh, expanding over to the West is that they just dumped the Chinese on the West Coast. And this caused problems for American workers. There's one man named Dennis Kearney. He's now a, a California populist political leader in the late 19th century. He was known for his nativist and racist views towards Chinese immigrants. And by August 1877, Kearney had been elected secretary of what was known as a newly formed Working Man's Party of California. So let's, yes, let's put Dennis Kearney and the Working Man's Party. They uh, <clears throat> led uh, often violent attacks on Chinese, including denunciations of the powerful Central Pacific Railroad, which had employed Chinese in large numbers. Now, Kearney was an Irish immigrant, so that made him subject to frequent accusations that he was a foreign agitator. But yet his populist rhetoric and his nativist baiting, similar to the tactics that's used by Rush Limbaugh or Glenn Beck or, or Tucker Carlson, or, it gained him a considerable following. In the late 1880s, Kearney claimed credit for making the Chinese question a national issue affecting the legislation of the Chinese Exclusion Act in 1882. Now let's deal with the Chinese Exclusion Act of 1882. Now in California, at first when surface gold was plentiful, the Chinese were well tolerated and well received. But as gold became harder to find and competition increased, animosity towards the Chinese and other foreigners increased. And after forcibly being driven from the mines, most Chinese settled in enclaves in cities, mainly San Francisco, and they took up low-end wage labor, such as restaurant work and laundry work. Now, with the post-Civil War economy in decline in the 1870s, anti-Chinese animosity became politicized by Dennis Kearney and the Working Men's Party, as well as California's governor, John Bigler. Kearney and Bigler both blamed the Chinese for depressing wage levels. Another significant group anti-Chinese group organized in California during the same era was known as the Supreme Order of Caucasians. And they created 64 chapters throughout the state and they harassed Chinese communities. Newspapers around the country 
and especially in California, started to discredit and blame the Chinese for most things, especially for white unemployment. The police also discriminated against the Chinese by using the slightest opportunity to arrest them. Let's take a look at a documentary featuring the nativist reaction and Chinese immigrants. As the job market tightened, resentment and violence against Chinese laborers increased, the most prevalent sign of a growing nativist movement aimed at all immigrants. In 1882, just one year after Qin Long's arrival in California, the United States passed legislation banning most Chinese immigration. The Chinese Exclusion Act um, excluded Chinese laborers from entering the United States, exempted diplomats, students, and merchants. It also denied all Chinese, regardless of what their class status was, um, the right to become an American citizen. And I think it was passed because of the rise of nativism during that time period. Obviously, there's a certain class fear about Chinese laborers coming into the country, and that's why they're specifically targeted for exclusion. But I think it receives national support and it receives support from all the various classes because all Chinese are viewed as somehow un-American, that they bring over not just the possibility of lowering the wage scale, but also these dangerous habits associated with heathenism. It really sets the precedent for a series of Asian exclusion laws and really immigration exclusion laws as a whole. Immigrant and minority groups, they're always the first to be victimized in times of societal stress. When there are economic problems, they're blamed for bringing on the economic problems. When there are crimes, they're blamed for being the criminals. Even when there's no evidence, people assume the other. The Exclusion Act would finally be repealed in 1943. But until then, facing loneliness, discrimination, and the threat of violence, Many Asian immigrants chose to return home, but many more stayed in San Francisco and built a strong cross-cultural society that would have a deep and lasting impact on American life. So the Chinese Exclusion Act was a significant restriction on free immigration in U.S. history. The act excluded Chinese skilled and unskilled laborers and any Chinese employed in mining. It excluded them from entering the country for 10 years under penalty of imprisonment and deportation. The act also affected Asians who had already settled in the United States. Any Chinese who left the United States had to obtain certification for re-entry. And the act made Chinese immigrants permanent aliens by excluding them from U.S. citizenship. And after the act's passage, Chinese men in the U.S. had little chance of ever reuniting with their wives, or of starting families in their new home. So for all practical purposes, the Exclusion Act, along with restrictions that followed it, froze the Chinese community in place in 1882, and it prevented it from growing and assimilating into US society as European immigrants did. And that's why the melting pot theory just does not work for the Asian experience. Now let's take a look at another labor union. And that labor union is known as the American Federation of Labor. The American Federation of Labor was one of the first federation of labor unions in the United States. It was founded in 1886 by an alliance of craft unions disaffected from the Knights of Labor, the National Labor Association. Now Samuel Gompers was elected president of the federation at its founding convention and was re-elected every year except one until his death. Now, as the Knights of Labor faded away, the AFL coalition gradually gained strength. Now, in practice, AFL unions were important in industrial cities, where they formed a central labor office to coordinate the actions of different AFL unions. Most strikes were assertions of jurisdiction, so that the plumbers, for instance, used strikes to ensure that all major construction problems uh, projects in cities used union plumbers. So to win, they needed the support of other unions. Hence the need for AFL solidarity. Now, Gompers promoted harmony amongst the different craft unions that comprised the AFL. It focused on higher wages and job security. The AFL fought against socialism and the Socialist Party. 
And after 1907, it formed alliances with the Democratic Party at the local, state, and national levels. Now, ultimately, the American Federation of Labor favored the old, skilled immigrant worker over the new, unskilled immigrant worker. So the AFL was very uh, uh, tight about who could join its ranks. You needed a skill. It did not like the unskilled immigrant. It liked the skilled worker. Now, as we have read and witnessed in the chapters, much violence accompanied the growth of industrialization. Strikes are common. People usually struck for what are known in labor history at this time as bread and butter issues. Now, what are bread and butter issues? Well, adequate pay, decent working hours, better working conditions, an eight-hour day. Can you imagine? They were tired, as Malcolm X would say, of working from can't see in the morning to can't see at night. So strikes were their only effective tactic to get owners to listen to them. Strikes are important because they stop the production process, and this impacts the owner's profits. So by 1881, the federal government began keeping statistics on strike activity. And in the 1880s, there are around 500 strikes per year involving over 150,000 workers. And by the 1890s, there were anywhere from 1 to 2,000 strikes per year involving 750,000 workers. Now, strikes are not necessarily violent, but strikes do measure a level of conflict between capital and labor. Historians see this period as open class warfare. Workers versus owners, especially due to the hiring of armies of private police to quell working class agitation. Now let's take a look at one of the, uh, an important strike is known as the Homestead Strike. Now the Homestead Strike was an industrial lockout and a strike which began on June 30th, 1892. And it culminated in a battle between strikers and private security agents on July 6th, 1892. Now the Homestead Strike ranks as one of the most serious disputes in U.S. labor history. The conflict occurred at Homestead Steelworks in the town of Homestead, Pennsylvania, between the Amalgamated Association of Iron and Steel Workers and the Carnegie Steel Company. The final result was a major defeat for the union and a setback for workers to unionize steel workers. Let's visit a documentary that helps us appreciate the Homestead strike. The Homestead Strike The waning decades of the 19th century saw a rise in the influence and power of organized labor unions. They were responsible for major changes in the lives of the workers who toiled to produce the materials that were transforming America into an industrial powerhouse. This put them at odds with the owners and operators of the factories and mills in which they worked, specifically Andrew Carnegie. The Carnegie Steel Company owned the Homestead Steelworks, among others, located in Homestead, Pennsylvania. In the summer of 1892, this would be the location of a defining moment in the struggle of organized labor in United States history. In 1889, the Amalgamated Association of Iron and Steel Workers, the union that represented some of the workers at the Homestead Steelworks, won a difficult victory in a strike over wages and working conditions. This agreement was set to expire three years later, in July of 1892. When the time came to renew the agreement, Carnegie had instructed his manager, Henry Clay Frick, to break the union and to reorganize the whole affair. Although he was ostensibly in favor of workers' rights to organize, Carnegie thought the terms of the prior agreement were too restrictive and a hindrance to the operation of his business. The price of finished steel was down, so he needed to reduce wages, reduce the number of workers, or both. At Carnegie's direction, Frick negotiated with the union through late spring and early summer, offering terms that the union would certainly reject. 
On June 28, 1892, Frick began closing down parts of the mill and locking the workers out of their jobs. When this failed to force the union's hand, Frick closed the remaining parts of the homestead works. With the beginning of the lockout, the union voted to strike. Dubbed Fort Frick, barbed wire, sniper towers, and powerful water cannons were added to a wall along the mill. These measures were to keep out the workers. The strikers laid siege to the mill. Boats, trains, and even law enforcement deputies were turned away in an effort to prevent strike breakers from getting into the mill. Frick wanted to regain access to the besieged mill in order to restart production with non-union workers on July 6th. On the night of the 5th, 300 men from the Pinkerton Detective Agency boarded barges downriver. The plan was to secretly tow them up to Homestead, where they would surprise the striking workers and take control of the mill. Alerted of the plan, the workers and many residents went to the mill to repel the Pinkertons. A firefight erupted, lasting over 14 hours. By the time they surrendered, three Pinkerton men were dead. Nine strikers had also lost their lives. Almost a week later, 6,000 Pennsylvania state militia were brought in on the orders of Governor Pattison to take back the Homestead Steelworks. The company hastily built bunkhouses and kitchens, then brought in non-union strike breakers to live at the plant while the state militia guarded the exterior. The furnaces were relit on July 15th. Striking workers attempted to enter the plant to stop relighting, but were met with the bayonets of the militiamen, wounding six workers. Many of the steelworkers were arrested and charged with crimes for the shootout with the Pinkertons. None of the Pinkertons were charged due to brutality they faced upon surrendering. With the plant running at full production, the union was broken, but some tried to hold on. Finally, on July 23rd, Alexander Berkman, a known anarchist, came to town and made an assassination attempt on Henry Clay Frick. Frick was both shot and stabbed, but survived the attack. Public support eroded after the attempt on Frick, and the strike finally ended with the union workers going back to work on Carnegie's terms. The handling of the strike was a serious blow to Andrew Carnegie's reputation, but worse damage was done to the labor movement. The once powerful amalgamated association of iron and steel workers was a shadow of its former self. Its membership depleted, efforts to de-unionize other mills in the Midwest were successful. Organized labor in the region would take decades to recover. This brings us now to another very important strike and a, and a significant historical figure. Eugene Debs and the Pullman Strike. Now, the Pullman Strike was a nationwide conflict between labor unions and railroads that occurred in the United States in 1894. The conflict began in the town of Pullman, Illinois, a company town, on May 11th, when approximately 3,000 employees of the Pullman Palace Car Company began what was known as a wildcat strike in response to reductions in wage, bringing traffic west of Chicago to a halt. The American Railway Union, the nation's first industry-wide union, was led by Eugene V. Debs. Subsequently, that union became embroiled in what the New York Times described as a struggle between the greatest and most important labor organization and the entire railroad capital and it involved some 250,000 workers in 27 states at its peak. Now, the strike is going to be broken up by United States Marshals and some 12,000 United States Army troops, commanded by Nelson Miles, and it was sent in by President Grover Cleveland on the premise that the strike interfered with the delivery of U.S. mail. The strike violated the Sturman Antitrust Act, and it represented a threat to public safety, according to President Grover Cleveland. Now, the arrival of the military and the subsequent deaths of workers led to further outbreaks of violence. And during the course of the strike, 13 strikers were killed and 57 were wounded. Now, this strike is significant for Americans today because it convinced the political establishment that perhaps workers 
should be honored, not in the internationalist socialist tradition of May Day <coughs> that was created as a result of the Haymarket Affair, but in the U.S. custom of the first Monday in September. The September date for Labor Day was selected rather than the more widespread International Workers' Day because President Grover Cleveland in 1894 was concerned that the observance of the May 1st date would be associated with the nascent communist, syndicalist, and anarchist movements that, though distinct from one another, had rallied to commemorate the Haymarket Affair and International Workers' Day. So all U.S. states, the District of Columbia, and the territories eventually made the September date a, a statutory holiday. Let's listen to a historian explain how Labor Day came to be celebrated in the United States. In the early 1880s, labor conditions were pretty hard. A lot of new immigrants were coming to America. They were reasonably unskilled, but often quite cheap labor, and they were exploited for such. So that the typical work day could be 12 hours, uh, they often worked six days a week, sometimes seven days a week. Child labor was not allowed, but it wasn't regulated, and so kids as young as six, seven, eight, ten worked in the mills, and the conditions were not terribly safe. There were terrible accidents that occurred. The first Labor Day was uh, September 1882. The founder probably was Matthew McGuire. He helped to organize a major march and demonstration to affirm labor's rights. And 10,000 people marched. That was a Tuesday. It was the first Tuesday in September. What triggered a National Labor Day in 1894 was a rather dramatic strike that took place. The Pullman workers in Chicago went out on strike. The federal government intervened because the Pullman cars, basically you know, with a boycott of them, stopped the American railway system from operating. So the federal troops were called out to crush the strike. People were killed. It was a terribly violent strike. It was not a happy day for labor. Government, being politicians, wanted labor on their side, and so as a concession, they then passed legislation authorizing a Labor Day, first Monday in September, from then on. Labor Day has evolved since 1894. Increasingly, even the marches and the parades became really opportunities to, to be for a patriotic holiday, more than actually a celebration of labor, per se. But the union makes us strong. We have paid holidays because of the labor movement. We have a eight-hour day because of the labor movement. We have paid vacations because of the labor movement. We have health care, those of us who still have it, because of the labor movement. And it's a chance really to recognize those kinds of gains. But over time, it's become much more than that. It has become, for all of us, the marker of the end of summer the beginning of school, an opportunity for picnics, for barbecues. In its own way, ironically, Labor Day is as much about consumption as it is about labor nowadays. I'd like to think that the problems facing labor and unemployment are on people's minds. I'm sure that they are on people's minds. I'm not sure that Labor Day is triggering those concerns anymore. And that's unfortunate. Okay, so uh, that ends uh, part four of the Gilded Age.